Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the British School of Rome and to tonight's lecture, which is part of a um, course that the BSR runs every year called the City of Rome Postgraduate Course, um, which engages with the archaeology, history, and topography of the ancient city of Rome. Tonight's speaker, Stefano Camporeale, um, is Associate Professor of Classical Archaeology at the University of Siena. Uh, before this appointment, he was a lecturer in Classical Archaeology at the University of Trento from 2014 to 2016, and he was a Marie Curie Fellow at the École Normale Supérieure of Paris, 2011 to 2013. His main research interests lie with construction techniques in the Roman world, building processes, but also encompass Greek and Roman archaeology and architecture, the archaeology of the ancient Mediterranean and of the Roman provinces, the history and archaeology of Roman North Africa, material culture in general, the archaeology of production, as well as the use of digital tools and technologies applied to classical archaeology and to the archaeology of architecture. He has co-organized the series of five international conferences on the Archeologia della Construcción, 2007 to 2015, and has also published the respective proceedings. Uh, Stefano has worked on a, at a range of archaeological sites across Italy and the Mediterranean, especially Morocco, where he undertook his doctoral research on Roman building techniques at the local sites of Sala, Banaza, and Tamuzida. And I must say, I remember Tamuzida with particular pleasure because this was one of the first uh, main uh, research projects that I worked at together with Stefano recording the material culture of this archaeological site and then I carried on myself with the study of Roman Morocco and Stefano has been really helpful in providing his assistance over my own doctoral research. Um, Stefano has also carried out research on private and public architecture at other Moroccan archaeological sites especially Lixus and Volubilis sites in Greece, particularly Ephestia, Egypt, the site of Dionysias, and Spain, Merida. Um, his most recent research projects include excavations at the sites of Roselle and Populonia, architectural surveys on the diffusion of the so-called Opus Africanum masonry across the ancient Mediterranean, as well as the study of building techniques of the Domus Tiberiana on the Palatine in collaboration with Mirella Servorenzi of the Superintendenza of Rome, which is a project which was carried out from 2013 to 2017, and which will be the topic of tonight's talk, entitled Domus Tiberiana, Urbanism, Building Processes, and Construction Techniques on the Palatine's Northern Slope. Please welcome Stefano Comporeale. Thank you. Thank you, Nicolò. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, so thank you for inviting me and for giving me the opportunity to present some of the results of a new study on the Domus Tiberiana that was carried out from 2013 to 2017 under the direction of the Superintendenza of Rome. It was a study in the archaeology of construction applied to an imperial large-scale building project with many building phases that transformed the northwestern portion of the Palatine Hill over time. The Domus Tiberiana covers a roughly square area of uh, four hectares on the Palatine. This area measures 195 meters north-south and two 112 meters east-west. The original construction occupied the upper level of the Palatine here, uh, but during time the Domus was progressively enlarged uh, toward the limits of the hill. Impressive substructures were built on several levels on the slopes of the Palatine. The external limits of the complex are the Via Nova and the Clivus Palatinus, uh, between 22 and 30 meters above sea level. And the upper terrace of the Horti Farnesiani is located at 50 meters above sea level. That means 30 meters 
higher than the Forum Romanum. From the half of the 16th century, the upper terrace was occupied by a Renaissance garden called the Orti Farnesiani. This is a green area that has always impeded to explore the original extension of the palace, and in fact, the portion we know better corresponds to the substructures, mainly the northwestern substructure that is the most monumental one. This portion always remained visible, and in fact, I mean, I'm talking about this portion here. This portion uh, always remained visible, and in fact, it has been included in the first studies on the imperial architecture on the Palatine. The substructure was wholly excavated by Lanciani, and the building phases recognized uh, thanks to brick stamps. The first detailed study on the northwestern corner of the Domus is by Van Neman, that identified the structures belonging to each phase. Uh, pre-Domitian that she, that she identified as pre-Domitian, Domitian and Hadrianic. At that time, in the area south of the facade, only the famous cryptoportici were known, dated to the Neronian period by Blake and others. In 1981, new excavations began in the Domus, carried out by Clemens Krause, that published the first results of, the, of, of his project in two main publications in 1985 and 1994. He also carried out a complete architectural survey of the whole complex. He again tried to identify the building phases labeled as Neronian, Flavian, Hadrianic, and Severan, and these phases correspond to the colors you see in, here in this, in this image. In this other picture on the left, you have an example of the very synthetic presentation of the building phases in the publication of 1994 by Krause, Domus Tiberiana I. The second volume with the architectural study unfortunately never appeared. Only <clears throat> some other excavations were made uh, by other scholars on the Nova Via, mainly on the Nova Via, like Henry Hurst. Uh, but only many years after new excavations were organized when restoration works were needed in order to consolidate the structures and walls of the Domus Tiberiana. The results were published in 2011 on the right. Other restoration works were necessary in, two, uh, in 2013, and this same year a new, group, a new work group was born with the collaboration of different institutions and specialists. The study of such an important context has led to the need to standardize the immense mass of existing documentation produced over time with different methods and objectives. This work has been carried out within the CITAR, the Archaeological Territorial Information System of the Sompritenenza of Rome, from which the map of the Domus Tiberiana you see in the image is taken. The different colors correspond to the heights at which the different structures are located. These are not the phases, I mean. <clears throat> Our work had the aim of studying the building stratigraphy and techniques. In a first stage, we concentrated on the northern slope and particular, particularly on the buildings facing the Via Nova and the Clivus Palatino. So this is the area of the first study. In a second stage, the same kind of analysis was extended uh, to the Hadrianic enlargement of the substructure. In 2017, we had the, also the opportunity to undertake an excavation in a portion here <coughs> um, of the Hadrianic substructure. We also could work in coordination with the structural engineers uh, who had the, the task of verifying the stability of this portion before it, it could be reopened to the public. This work led not only to the detailed study of building techniques, but also to observations concerning the urban layout of the northern slope of the Palatine over time. In this image, you can appreciate the powerful northwestern substructure, as well as its relationship with the buildings located along the Nova Via at a lower level. Three flights of stairs are clearly visible starting from the Nova Via, here, here, and here. Uh, 
um, and going southwards, uh, climbing the hill. The stratigraphic analysis carried out on the walls concerned the layout of the Imperial Age road, where only some, pre, some of the pre-existing structures are still visible. Therefore, for the Republican period, we cannot make any significant changes to previous hypotheses. First of all, uh, I will briefly illustrate the phasing of the buildings on the Nova Via and Clivo Palatino to arrive at a new reconstructive hypothesis on the urban network of the area. We identify on the, on the Clivo Palatino here and the Nova Via here, we identified seven different buildings. Building one consists of four adjacent rooms open onto the Clevus Palatinus built in the Flavian age on the previous Neronian layout and completely rebuilt in the Severan period. Building two consists of three rooms side by side delimited by two flights of stairs. It can be dated at least to the age of the mission for the presence of two brick stamps <coughs> of Gnaeus Domitius Arignotus of the second half of the first century, attested on the Palatine no later than 93-94 AD in the walls of the Domus Severiana, the Domus Augustana and the Stadium. Building 3 was originally made up of a series of seven rooms arranged on two floors who, uh, whose uh, original continuity was interrupted by the insertion of the staircase, this one, um, leading to the uh, Uccelliere Farnesiane, uh, a part of the Horte Farnesiani. The building, perhaps dating back to Nero, was renovated in the Flavian and Severan periods when the second floor was built and the buttresses were added to the facade. This building borders on the west with a third flight of stairs that also serves as a limit to building four, built ex novo in the Severan age. Finally, um, we find the Hadrianic project larger and more complex um, than the previous one, sorry, uh, being in turn divided internally by flights of stairs in building five and six for a height still preserved of two floors and, and three levels. The sixth building uh, ends at the Scale Greche that determined the oblique orientation of the western perimeter wall. Both buildings were renovated and consolidated in, in the Severan period with the addition of five contrast, five arches, this ones, um, uh, that cross the Nova Via and lean against the rear wall of the House of the Vestals. Finally, on the Clivus Palatinus is located building, we find the seventh building, perhaps dated on the basis of the building technique to the Hadrianic period, consisting of six side-by-side -side taberne. The first remains of the Imperial Age we identified at the corner between Nova Via and Clivus Palatinus can be attributed to the intervention of the rectification of, the, of, the, of this road, traditionally attributed to Nero, since they seem to fit into the urban organization related to the construction of the Domus Aurea. In particular, it is possible to attribute to the Neronian age a network of concrete foundations with, with travertine caimenta in pink, orthogonal to each other and oriented along the lines of Nova Via and Clivo Palatino. On these foundations are brick-faced walls in red in the picture, partly still preserved. These structures follow the alignment of a previous late Republican Augustan substructure wall and a domus above in purple on the right. Start, starting with Van Dieman, uh, the travertine foundations have been attributed to a monumental portico along the Clivus Palatinus, recently rebuilt by Daniela Bruno in the Atlas of Rome. Uh, that you can see, in, and that this reconstruction is the one in the, in the picture uh, on the right. 
Um, anyway, the attribution to the, to the neuronian phase of the brick phase walls allows us to consider a new hypothesis on the arrangement of the area and in particular on the reconstruction of the particle. Uh, we believe that uh, this particle was articulated with a single span along the clivus palatinus and that in the rare, in the rare part there was a double row of tabernae. So here. Um, considering the inclination of the clivus palatinus, the particle was probably articulated in levels connected by stairs. We can also reconstruct an internal passage um, here, uh, that from the portico crossing the space of a taberna with a staircase led to a secondary road, this one, uh, running parallel to the Nova Via on the slope of the hill. This road system was never assumed until now, but is necessary to allow access uh, to all the rooms, partly, partly still preserved, uh, that were on the back of the buildings overlooking the Nova Via. In the upper part of the map, you can see the area occupied by the Domus Tiberiana in red in this phase. In fact, according to Krause, the Domus Tiberiana was probably built by Nero and it corresponded to a block of 150 square meters. And this is the, the reconstruction of the Domus Tiberiana of this phase made by, uh, by Krause. <coughs> The road running half height on the slope follows precisely the route and the altitude of the, of the road on which the Ninfeo della Pioggia of the Orti Farnesiani was set in the Renaissance period. In fact, if we look at the map by Nolli in relation to this area, a straight path, this one, um, corresponds to the ancient one we reconstructed. In the plan by Nolli, this route continues straight on towards the west, which suggests that it could also be so in antiquity, as it will appear more clearly in the reconstruction of the next phase. According to Krause, the Domus was first enlarged by Vespasian and Domitian. In particular, the limit of the palace was moved towards the north, east and west, where Domitian built the famous ramp, the ramp, I mean, this here, um, allowing to climb from the Forum directly to the Palatine. The new facade of the Domus was aligned to a street called the, um, the Clevus Victorium. Uh, on the Nova Via, we can highlight some changes that, that do not, uh, did not alter the urban scheme previously set. Only Building 2 is radically rebuilt with three large uh, rooms, and at the same time, it seems that the regular scanning of the, of the Neuronian road network was extending, extended to the upper terraces of the hill until it joined the square this one, uh, sorry, this one, um, that was, that had always been assumed to be in front of the palace of the Flavian era. Under Hadrian, this is the traditional chronology confirmed by the brick stamps, a new large-scale project was planned. To the northwestern corner, an artificial terrace was built, here, uh, projecting towards the forum and sustained by the famous arch, the substructures that dominate the skyline. The facade of the complex was finally aligned with that of the buildings along the Nova Via. The Clevus Victoria was incorporated inside the construction, in the, here, and covered by high vaults organized on two levels. From this moment, the Domus Tiberiana became an even more complex architectural organism from a structural and constructional viewpoint. During the Severan age, um, the buildings along the streets were raised of one floor, consolidation works were carried out, and the sequences of buildings along the streets were completed. Arched, uh, arches crossing the streets were, and buttresses were also added. <coughs> I will now look, we will now look at the uh, Hadrianic project more uh, specifically that included the simultaneous construction of an insula along the Nova Via, this one, 
the buildings uh, five and six, um, and the substructure for the enlargement of the palace on the top of the hill. A deeper analysis of this complex allows a better understanding of both parts, the insula at the bottom and substructure on top, namely their structural, constructional and functional relationship. The project was realized on all levels of the slope of the Palatine, the level of the Horti Farnesiani, of the Clivus Victoria and down to the Novavia. Concerning the insula on the Novavia, its western portion is best preserved. The facade was pierced by large uh, windows. At the ground floor there were three access doors, uh, one leading to the staircase, one to a service room under the stairs, and another one to the ground floor. Originally, <coughs> uh, this building was organized at least in three levels on the slope of the hill, and it was necessary to build a grid of terracing walls. Some of these walls probably corresponded to previous structures integrated into the new construction. In the reconstructed plan, you can see that each floor consists of four main rooms separated by dividing walls. These are the four main rooms that are on at each floor. As the level rises, more rooms have been added behind the four main ones, gaining space and exploiting the slope of the hill. In the case of this insula, therefore, the ground floor was narrower and darker, while the second floor was the largest, brightest, and most spacious, thanks to the presence of a second row of rooms. The height of the vault also increases for uh, 44 meters at ground floor until 5 meters and 15 uh, sec second floor. Uh, on the first floor, we see the terracing wall made of irregular reticulate with blocks of 9 to 12 centimeters. On the second floor, this wall uh, continues in bricks as it changes its function. That is no longer a terracing wall. I would also like uh, to underline that, the reticulate, that this reticulate wall has always been attributed to the late Republican or Augustan age on the basis of the technique. But a comparison with the insula of Araceli allows it to be assigned, probably, to be assigned to the construction of the Hadrianic insula. In the Araceli insula, in fact, one can see a terracing wall similar to this one in irregular reticulate bonded to the dividing walls between the rooms uh, that are made of bricks. As we said, each floor had, uh, has four main rooms. The three rooms on the left uh, communicate between them through two doors, to, through a system of two doors, while the first room uh, on the right is linked to the adjacent one uh, only by one door. Two doors here, one and two, and only one door here. He, he, here in this wall, the, 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 the door is the second door is lacking. Uh, on each of the floors, uh, some rooms are subdivided by thinner walls. The resultant li uh, little rooms are probably cubicula. The floors are decorated with a black and white geometrical mosaic. Little panels in mosaic underline the thresholds. Walls are decorated um, by, with paintings with the same style of those found in the residential insula of Austria uh, of the Hadrianic period. The thinner dividing walls are made with a tegula on one face and a kind of opus incertum on the other. Several building techniques have been employed to construct the building. The perimeter walls are made of yellow to light orange basales. The internal dividing walls are made either entirely of fragmented uh, tegulae or of opus mixtum with tegulae. The distribution of building techniques appears to be regulated according to an economic rationale as well as structural reasons. 
With the progressive increase in the use of bricks, we pass from the terracing wall in Charling Reticulate to the dividing walls in Opus Mixtum uh, to the facade in Charling in bricks. Bricks are used in the perimeters of the building because of the better technical quality of the material that was to be exposed to the outside. <coughs> At the corners where visible, one can observe the contact between different kinds of bricks used in the perimeter walls. Here you see the, the, the bond between the one dividing walls and the, and the, and the facade. The facade has a yellow bipedalis and the internal wall has the red roof tiles. In the Severan period, some arches crossing the Nova Via were added. These were built at least on two levels and they were designed in order to push against the facade of the Domus Tiberiana on one side and the house of the Vestals on the other. Consequently, they prevent the walls to tilt and collapse towards the street. Here you can you also see the arches built inside the rooms on the right. They form an armature that works together with the arches crossing the street. The function of these elements is of creating a series of counterbalanced thrusts. As we will understand, this operation had the aim of preserving the complex from the lateral movement that characterized the slope of the hill. Before arriving to at, uh, an interpretation of these structures, we must consider the I will consider the results of the structural analysis of the Hadrianic project. Structural analysis aims to identify the original structure and equilibrium of the buildings, as well as, in, uh, as, well as any subsequent modification. According to this point of view, each stage also implies a variation of the original equilibrium. In the case of articulated and monumental buildings like the Domus Tiberiana, an understanding of their configuration and static equilibrium can be very complex. Moreover, the Domus Tiberiana is a structure, uh, structure resulting from the sum of several constructive actions which have increased its mass over time and which have occupied the, uh, the slopes of the hill by settling on a sloping ground with foundations built on different geological levels. And in fact, uh, so here you see the, the geological levels of the Palatine. Here the substructure by Hadrian, and here the uh, insula on the, on the Nova Via. <clears throat> in fact, the geological stratification of the northern slope of the hill is formed by the superposition of different formations, which are subjected to a northwesterly movement. This movement is determined by the different composition of the soil and by the inclination of the layers. The di direction of these movements is described uh, by, is indicated by the yellow arrows in the picture. Of course, this phenomena had an impact on the equilibrium of the building, built uh, of the buildings built on the hill and on the solutions adopted to consolidate them. The red arrows represent the direction of the forces that cross the Domus Tiberiana with respect to hill movements or earthquakes these arrows here. Um, as we have seen, the Neronian and Flavian bodies of the Domus Tiberiana were originally built above the Palatine on stable and resistant soils. On the contrary, the successive Hadrianic and Severan st structures built on the slopes were subject to deformations, as we sh uh, shall see. The Hadrianic enlargement was very vulnerable from the beginning. According to the structural analysis of the project, it can be described here as a rectangular central body with an inner grid of walls that act as links between the perimeter walls. The perimeter, nonetheless, has the tendency to tilt outwards and so to cope with this phenomenon, other buildings, the insula, here and here, um, were added along the streets acting as buttresses. 
In the lower part of the image, you can see two details of the walls of the very high substructure of the palace that was simply placed against the Flavian facade. This is the Flavian facade, and, see, and this is the Hadrianic walls that leans against it. The builders tried to control the thrusts uh, through huge relieving arches inserted in the masonry. What is very important is that the two portions, substructure and buttress insulae, besides playing a different structural role, are also different from a functional and constructive point of view. I want to underline, uh, to stress in particular this point, that the structural analysis was essential to clarify even these aspects, even the function of the buildings. Keep in mind that um, the substructure of the palace at the upper level of the hill and the insula at the lower level are, are two very different things. Now we can go on. Concerning the substructure, it's, we go on and we try to identify the function of these two different portions of the, of the Domus Tiberiana. Concerning the substructure, its reconstruction is still being studied. It is difficult to understand, as already mentioned, um, the original layout of the facade, and the northwestern corner is difficult to understand. I mean, all this part, all this part, the, the, the collapsed facade of the Domus Tiberiana is very difficult to reconstruct. Uh, because it, this entire portion uh, collapsed. Uh, a reconstruction of the palace here was proposed by Clemens Krause, but his approach was not structural, and this led to mistakes. Krause, on the upper level of the palace, hypothesis, uh, um, assumes the presence here of uh, um, a peristyle whose northwestern corner had to weigh on the insula. You see this line projecting towards the limit of the insula on the Nova Via, corresponding to this alignment here. Um, this overlap of the substructure on the insula is not possible for structural and construction reason, reasons. Moreover, in the Taberne on the Nova Via, we have no traces of the huge diagonal wall on which the peristyle should be founded. We should see something, uh, some traces of this wall coming in a diagonal way here. A second reconstructive hypothesis uh, by Daniela Bruno is found, uh, was published in the Atlas of Rome. In this case, a large garden was reconstructed in the shape of a hypodrome at Pandang of the so-called Stadium of Domitian on the opposite side of the Palatine. Even if this reconstruction is more plausible, also in this case, the rare wall of the peristyle should have been founded on the insula this one, okay. um, on the insula where we find no traces of such a mighty structure, that is a, a, a wall with a height of 20 meters. Hmm. Following our work concerning the insula and the Nova Via, the use of building techniques as well as the decoration are closely compared with the uh, insula of Ostia and Rome. The variability of the materials and their different use for the different portions of the buildings is typical of this kind of architecture. It is sufficient to, uh, sufficient to show a comparison with the Casa Giordino, where, however, the use of bricks is the opposite, Besali inside and Tegula outside. Not only the building techniques, uh, but even the organization of the building shows that it falls into the category of insula. The most similar comparisons are found, in fact, with the particular series of apartments in Ostia and Rome, those with an internal corridor that runs just behind the facade of the building. Examples are the apartment located on the upper floor of the insula Lidiana, 
here a series of rooms with a corridor and a final larger room and that of the Araceli here with the corridor and the, and the rooms. In both cases, as highlighted by previous works by Packer, Delane, Wallace, Hedrill, just to mention a few of the most important names, the corridor seems to lead to a larger room. Also, in our case, on each level, we can identify an area here, for example, uh, I mean, a room without internal subdivisions. In the largest apartment on the top floor, we also recognize a suite of rooms, this one, uh, such as those visible in some apartments in Ostia, for example, in the house of the paintings and in, and in, a, in the house of Jupiter and Ganymede. The rare room, in addition to being connected uh, to the front one by a door, takes light through a window. In our case, the rare room was redecorated in the Antonin era, uh, age, um, and then in the Severan age with, uh, with new paintings and a marble plinth. Um, this category of apartments is normally considered inferior to the so-called Amedianum apartments because the possibilities of reception of the guests are scarce or, however, less developed. One wonders also if in the various rooms arranged along the corridor different families could be lodged that used in common the, um, the, the, the larger room at the end of the corridor. Uh, or even if in reality these were not houses, but also the seat of offices, business activities, and so on, especially for Ostia, given the commercial character of the city. In our case, however, there are further possibilities of interpretation. Let's look now again at the northern front of the Domus Tiberiana. To the orthogonal view of the front, we have, I have superimposed the reconstruction of the portion of the insula already described. Its height measures 60 feet and corresponds to the limit established by Trajan for the dwellings, Domuorum Altitudo. Towards the east, the building is less well preserved and we still have to complete the reconstruction. In any case, in one of its rooms, here, um, the gem of, the, of a doorway connecting the substructure and the insula is partially preserved. The door is on the second floor of the eastern part of the insula corresponding to the first level of the substructure. The door, the door gem is these little walls here and it corresponds to this uh, room here. Uh, the door can be seen also in these other images, a picture taken from the preserved part of the insula and a, and a plan extrapolated from the laser scan. In the picture on the left, you can also see the construction techniques of the substructure whose main load-bearing walls are made entirely of bricks. The composition of the core of these walls changes with respect to the, to the insula because in the substructure there are numerous lucidic caimenta as well as other heavy materials such as travertine and to a lesser extent marble. This difference in technique is perhaps related to the greater load that fell on the substructure that is that of the palaces elevations. In any case, it is now important to underline the connection between the insula and the substructure, which was not only structural or constructive, and in fact the project is unitary, but also functional. If, as I have tried to demonstrate, the insula at the foot of the palace contained apartments, the hypothesis is that they could house officials of the imperial court, probably not of a high level given the type of housing, and perhaps involved, involved in the activities that took place within the substructure. The difference between the apartments at the floor um, uh, the, the difference between the apartments 
uh, of the insula at the different floors is perhaps to be related to the hierarchy of officials depending on their position. In this regard, we can recall the study of the graffiti of the Domus Tiberiana made by Castren and Lilius. The graffiti found in the northern substructure uh, led the two Finnish scholars to assume that here were the offices of the imperial fiscus. These, these graffiti are in, these traces are impressions of coins in the fresh plaster, inscriptions with names of coins and numbers. However, these graffiti are concentrated in the Domitian portion, that is the portion here. What activities were carried out in the Hadrianic portion remains an open question. Perhaps given the enormous size of the rooms, the presence of a ramp here um, connecting the Clivus Victoria with the two levels of the substructure, as well as floors in Opus Spicatum, one could, one could imagine that here there were warehouses and storage areas for goods for the palace. In conclusion, our insula uh, could have had a mixed character and function and it would probably be more cautious uh, as well as more correct to assume that here the imperial officials had their lodgings but also carried out their duties as in offices. This is an observation that I think we should make also because of the typical interpenetration in the Roman world between residential buildings and commercial or productive activities. It would not be surprising if the same type of building had um, held all these functions, residential and administrative a theme that certainly needs to be explored in depth because it would, be, would open up new horizons also in the context of the history of Roman architecture. And thank you.